the joy is doing it. Yes. And the, it's almost like the memory of it, the joy of it is in your body. Yes. And then that thing on the wall behind you and that thing, shadow box over there and the plastic tub in the garage, those are external representations of what happens inside you when you did that thing. Yes. And what a beautiful segue to the show today. <laughs> we are so connected. People don't understand. I know I say this probably every second or third podcast that we don't discuss the podcast before the podcast. Ever. I haven't talked to you in a week. I haven't even dreamed about you in a week, except the dreams are too weird to talk about anyway. It's like you're we never talk, but you're never gone. Yes. It's that kind of, don't you love those kind of friendships or relationships? Call them slipper people oh. because you don't see them, talk to them for two years. You walk in or see you face to face and it's like slippers. You just pick up where you left off 10 years ago. Yes. I love that analogy. Two of my dearest friends I've had for over 40 years. They were my very first friends and years can go by and things. Sometimes it's a text or just a quick whatever. And you're right. You just pick up exactly where you left off. I wish treating patients were that easy. I don't know what your magic word is for the day, but I think there is a relationship that is formed, if it's healthy, it's formed between the practitioner and the patient, because if it's done, it is one of the most intimate in a not sexual way, but yeah. intimate yeah. relationships ever. Totally agree. And a lot to unpack with that last little statement. So when I was to pick up where we left off, mm -hmm. um, we were talking about our Kona adventures and teaching in Kona. And you had come in for a large part of the second day when I was going through the structure of integrating FSM into practices. And for massage therapists and acupuncturists and PTs that kind of already have it in their structure to spend more time with patients, I think it's a little easier to integrate the practitioners that are used to rolling through patients very quickly can sometimes have a challenge with FSM because of the time that it takes. Now, it's not to say you can't integrate it. It's you have to find different ways of integrating it. Yes. And so a 30 minute block is doable. I've done it in a 20 minute block as long as you have three rooms. The thing that takes adapting to is listening to figure it out. It's not how long does it take to treat them? It's how fast can you figure it out? Totally. And I think there's some practitioners, the ones that I have found that have had like I don't want to say negative feedback from the ones that have tried it and were like, I just, it didn't work well with me. I look at some of those practitioners and after I get to know them, and I think they were the ones that were uncomfortable with that intimate relationship that happens with FSM because you do, you get interwoven. And that's what I love about it. I love the history. I love figuring things out. I love creating and the word for today's plan. And I know you don't like, no, oh, I love your plan. Okay. But I am a planner. And I think that's why I am the therapist that I am. And I'm a detective. So the detective, the sleuth in me really loves pulling apart the history. How did we get here today? And then the planner in me loves to set up the future. Yep. Yeah. It, it, absolutely. So that's what makes me, for me now to take the train off the tracks for, for just a quick second. I work with my daughter's hockey teams quite intimately with 
recovery and sports therapy and, and all the things, but part of what I've been enjoying working with these teenagers is a little more of the psychosocial dynamic, helping them. And what we do is I make them do mandatory journal entries. And it's like how I can talk to you and everybody out there with my word of the week or the theme. So we have a theme, we have an intention every week and because I'm a planner. So the first journal entry question I asked them was, what is your superpower? So they're not like deep, dark, crazy journal entries, but just a little bit of self-reflection. And I'm asking everybody who is listening as a patient, as a practitioner, as a therapist, whoever, we all have our own superpowers that we bring to the table. No pun intended. And an awful lot of times, especially when you asked me that question, it really made me think because I don't know that I ever thought of it as a superpower. But once I said it out loud, it's synergy. That's my superpower is I can take a little from Jeff Bland, a little from Jeff Spencer, a little from you, my cat wreck, David Simons, John Sharkey, Neil Nathan, Tammy, a little bit from every, and I put it all together and it's synergy, but until someone asks you that question, I don't think you know. We need to get you a journal. What? We need to get you a journal. Get me? No, God, I hate journaling. I, <laughs> I speak mostly because it's like I write the way I talk, which is mm, go on. But the concept of asking a question like, "What's your superpower?" for me, when I have a, a new patient it's like what's the most important thing to you what is it that you want what's the most important thing and a lot of times they never thought about it I think these questions are huge in the beginning when you're doing your intake so is that one of your first questions that you ask them when they're first there is that something that you keep asking them it's I start with the I start with the pain diagram yeah. And a 10 centimeter line. Here, fill this out. Yeah. And I ask them to come in with a chronologic history. So I know looking at the pain diagram on the new patient paperwork, I said, whoa, okay. That, so looking at the pain diagram, I already know pretty much where we're headed. And then you look at the pain intensity and it's okay. And then before they start into their history, I have these two pieces and I'll say, what's the most important thing to you? Or if they want to go back into the history, I let them do that. There's a permission structure for me. Becoming a psychologist was a really good intro to this because it's not directive. It's you get to be whoever you are. How can I help you be who you want to be? And that's my question that I've been really making sure I'm asking. How do you foresee me helping you in this journey? Because if that just means them flopping on the table for an hour and checking out and not participating in all yeah. other things, we're not going to be a good synergistic team. And it's synergistic what happens, not just the treatment. It's all of it. You have to feel safe in my presence. You have to feel safe in this room. Your body has to feel safe to move. All of it has to feel good and exciting. I have stumbled across the thank you notes that I've gotten over the years. And my sister told me we should put them in a book. And it's, oh, shucks, I get all embarrassed. But it's the notes from patients and practitioners about how what we did with FSM changed their lives in just the most eloquent terms. You do that by starting where you start. If making someone feel safe in your presence is a matter of running 40 and 89 for 60 minutes, or 40, that's quieting the midbrain for the not number of people, or 
you touch them in their abdomen or their groin or someplace and they just burst into laughter and can't control it. We have a tool that lets us run 40 and 92, quiet the sensory cortex, and within three to five minutes, they're not ticklish. And I had one patient, he had an anterior hip replacement. And he, all of a sudden, he's not ticklish. And he said, how did you do that? I'm always ticklish. I've never not been ticklish in that place. And it's, oh, there's a thing. Now, let me work on your hip. There's a thing we do. It's really fun. And that frequency comes in so handy when going after somebody's hip flexors, rec fem tendon. It is a super jumpy area. Even just, and I don't know if this comes back to being tickled as a kid, but if somebody has their hands a certain way and they're coming at my midsection, like I'll just tense up right away and not in that horrified way, but it's the anticipation of the tickle that's coming. And some people are just so jumpy there. So that is a fantastic tool to utilize. I love our tools. There's a slide. FSM is a tool that lets you, that you didn't think you needed, that does something that you didn't think was possible. There's a slide. Yeah, that should be every three slides because you, you just don't get it. But it's true. I was the biggest skeptic. I thought it was silly. I thought, what could be better than my hands? But it is the tool that makes my hands better. It is the tool that makes my plan work faster. Yep. Listening to a podcast the other day about Brazilian jiu-jitsu. <laughs> okay. But it went lateral. And the way the instructor was talking about it was poetic. And I could have sworn he was talking about FSM. He was talking about patterning and recruitment and it makes the practitioner better and unchanged and it reconfigures not only the person that they are fighting against but the person who you are and who you become and I feel like that was the change with me it was not just experiencing the tissue change on the patient it was the changes of me as a practitioner and we talked about the word I said it forced me to think outside the box or it forced me to become better. It allows you to. No, it really forces you to. Unless <laughs> you are satisfied with mediocrity. If yeah. you are satisfied with, oh, then, okay. Yeah. If what I want is the patient's right SI joint not to be stuck. Yeah. That is what I want because the patient's goal is to get rid of the pain in her left SI joint. Yes. So she can run. It's not that she wants her L4-5 disc not to be thin and desiccated. She wants not to be afraid of her L4-5 disc being thin and desiccated. On the most superficial level, my job is to get the right SI joint to move. Now, if I was a good chiropractor, which I'm not, I would just smack on the right SI joint and get the, the joint to move, but muscles move bones. So how do you get the right SI joint to not be stuck? In our world, you take the adhesions out of the ureter and that's just part of the core anymore. If the SI joint is stuck hard, means that the psoas is tight. Why is the psoas tight? And the QLs tight. Why are they tight? Yeah. It has to be the ureter, the kidney, and the kidney fat bed. So let's treat that and see what happens. Right. What if? Right. And then, yes, that was all good. But the, the second thing on the list was I'm afraid that I have the L4-5 disc is thin and desiccated and I'm only 40 something. And the scary part is what will happen when I get older. And why is it that has to go? Did you ever have pneumonia or asthma? Oh, your trunk doesn't move. So we moved your trunk. That will take care of the 4-5 disc. And 
so following the breadcrumbs and having a tool that lets you do it instantly yeah relatively to be able to do in two hours what is three months worth of work easy six or whatever to piggyback on this and it's, I love being personally in pain because it helps me become a better practitioner. The lessons I learned being on the table in Kona have helped me exponentially the last week with not just thinking through, but just the anxiety and fear to remember what it's like to, I'm not afraid to move but I know how ugly that x-ray looked. That's the only thing I could see in my head. But when you have a practitioner that breaks down the pain, walks you through the breadcrumbs, I think it's a huge part of the patient taking the big scary picture into little bite-sized pieces. And I know what's the thing that Kevin says, you just do it one bite. Do the next it. thing. Do the next thing, yes. And when you look at it, like that's how I run. I never go out thinking, oh, I have 10 miles. If you start your run thinking about how far 10 miles is, it is very defeating. It's very scary. But if I just break it up into, okay, I'm going to go from here to the top of that hill. And then I'm going to turn left. And then I'm going to do that segment. And then I'm going to do that segment. And then I'm going to turn around and then I'm going to be home. And then it's, it's just different. So when you broke it apart, Biomechanics is actually very simple. Something is stuck or something is inhibited. It's two avenues that you're going through. Pretty much. Something's not being able to turn on or something is stuck preventing the, the motion from happening. And then the third piece of that is everything is connected to everything. Exactly. So when you think about those, I don't want to say small, but those more simplistic principles you as a practitioner all of a sudden are not so overwhelmed and you as the patient, it's not so scary. There's pieces. And then you start feeling as a practitioner, you start feeling the smush, the patient starts feeling relief. And again, that just takes everything down a notch. And then you just do the next thing. Perfect. And if you are a practitioner. This goes to the challenge that we present to practitioners that start out in FSM. If you are a practitioner that just wants to run chronic disc for that L4-5 disc, I'll just run this protocol and doesn't figure out, doesn't like, or their mind isn't suited to why is L4-5 shearing? If their mind doesn't go there, yeah, we can treat chronic disc. I don't have any trouble with that. But it's ultimately not going to work if you don't. Eventually, I figured it out. Like I said, you do anything 200,000 times, you better get good at it or get another job. So it's right. So the practitioners that are listening need to cut themselves some slack. There's no reason you should figure this out in the 30 minutes, 45 minutes, twice a week for four to six weeks. It gives you time to figure out why it comes back, why this is happening, and it gives you time to sort through stuff, right? Totally. To go back to the disc, somebody had asked me privately if we had run disc when we were in Kona and we didn't run one disc frequency, which this person thought was absolutely crazy because thought everything was splinting because of the disc. And I said, I'm like, I see where you're going with that because yes, muscles do splint to protect discs. But again, this is again, knowing a little bit more of biomechanics and structure, 
to have such a depleted L4, L5 is not organic when L4, L5 is fluffy, L5, S1 is fluffy. Everything is fluffy in just that one segment. That's not normal. That was a clue. And yes, if I was seeing you twice a week for four to six weeks, if we fixed why L4, 5 was thin and desiccated, then on the third visit, we could have run, honestly, I never run chronic disc. I'm, I'm bad. Uh, but you had no discogenic pain, right? right? So the disc was not a pain generator. The mechanics were off. And running chronic disc, ha if we had a third custom care, which we didn't, so like it didn't hurt to put a washcloth in back, washcloth in front, and let that run in the background just in case. Sure. And I will run stuff for my disc when I have time to sit down. Sure. Um, Converters at night. Yes. And again, these are tools to help with. So here's the other thing. And again, this is part of how I teach the sports course is you have a busy practice. What can the patient run at home? that doesn't require your hands or your skills or your brain. The disc, that can be run unattended is how I always start filtering out what's needed is what is attended and what is unattended. What yep. can I give the patient on or recommend to them to use on their custom care that's gonna help expedite their results in the comfort of their own home? And what exercises can you give them to do that will support stabilization and circulation segmentally? And what you said about being a patient is so important. I share my medical history. Oh, yeah, I had one of those. Yep, had that too. Yep. And, but you learn so much. You learn so much. And it's like how you talk about some of the chronic pain patients that come in with the emotions of anger and resentment and bitterness. And you, if you flip it right away with well, what did it give you? What did you learn? Yeah. And you do, you learn patience, you learn empathy. And as much of a planner as I am, like you, you learn to just surrender a little bit. So there was this one picture that Eduardo had taken of you working on me and I'm just I've got my kind of my arms out to the side and there was just this moment of like bliss on my face and it's total submission <laughs> which is really difficult for me I love being in control and safety it's when you have that look it is such a blessing for the practitioner yeah when a patient gets anxious or splints I just stop you have to, yeah. And say, what's up? Oh, that hurts. Or it's going to hurt. Okay, let's take it slower then. And we have a tool that lets us manage that. So yeah. you run 40 and 89, quiet the part of the scary part of the brain. Yeah. 40 and 396. So quiet the nerve, quiet yeah. the cord. Yeah. And then all of the drivers that make pain sensitization a real thing we have the ability to take those down a notch and then if you're running scar tissue you you have the ability to literally melt the adhesions that are causing the inhibition yeah the tightness right yeah it's so it, cool when i was trying to flex my hip and had to externally rotate. That was a big learning moment for me because right away I thought my external rotators are tight. They're yanking my femur into external rotation. That's where the biomechanic chem defaults to structure. What's tight, what's weak? Like, what is it trying to avoid? I was like, oh, <laughs> that shift in thinking changed everything. It's why are the external rotators taking over so that your hip externally rotates? That's not normal. It's externally rotated just one step further, not being satisfied with it's externally rotated. 
So we're going to dig on your piriformis. That's cool. No, because that wouldn't have helped anything. No, but it, I think it's how people come to us as therapists, especially physical medicine practitioners have the worst time with FSM. I think it's the most difficult because it hurts your brain. It hurts your brain. So your external rotators are working super hard to externally rotate. And you just, thanks to George, you take the next step. Why are they doing that? In my life, literally, Kim, in 29 years of doing this, I have never, ever treated scarring in the appendix. That day in Kona was the first time ever I treated scarring in the appendix, at which point your external rotators were happy and you went like this. Yeah. And I've had patients where they do a squat and their external rotators are weak and their knees come in. Yeah. Well, they're not weak, they're inhibited. So it doesn't. And the therapists that have been working on this particular athlete I have in mind, I put him on the table and put my thumb into his pectineus and brevis to see when did you get your groin pull? Why? That's really tender. There is no circumstance under which your brain is going to let you use your external rotators when the internal rotators are glued to the artery and the nerve. And they had been strengthening his external rotators. Right. No. Isn't it just so cool to have a tool that lets you dissolve the adhesions between the nerve and the artery and the fascia in 20 minutes? Y yes. But it's also now, okay, you're given this power and you have to be responsible with it and know what to do with it. For instance, Kona World Championships, Kona is in seven weeks and there's a ton of triathletes in the Bay Area that have blessed me. So I'm treating a ton right now. And one particular athlete got a whole bunch of tracking issues on one side. I know exactly what I need to do, but seven weeks out, it's what you always say. Now it's a sort of a maintenance problem. We can't pull everything apart and teach you how to run again. That terrifies her. So we're just patching the boat until and getting you as good as we can get you bite by bite doing the next thing until Kona. And the thing is, I'm not exactly sure. I agree with all of that because in two days, two one-hour sessions, you went from finding it really hard to run to running 10 miles, five downhill, five uphill, and the five uphill was faster than the downhill. And that was my set. Yeah, that was the back half. Yeah. yeah. And I would say that the triathlete who comes in with whatever, if you can fix the mechanics in some way that is comprehensive, I wouldn't do it two weeks before. Seven weeks, you've got five weeks. It's like I had a pitcher with a professional baseball team and he had a tendonitis here, strained tendon. I said, what'd you do? He said, oh, the pitching coach had me make change my style to put a spin on it. And so basically he had a tendinopathy and he had adhesions. He's a pitcher. So he's got adhesions all in the front and along the long thoracic nerve and his brachial plexus and all of that. So I worked on him for two days, an hour a day for two days, and then told him, and I knew the coach, and I said, 
okay, here's the deal. No 90s tomorrow. You don't do 90 mile an hour pitches tomorrow. You do form and slow until your brain figures it out. And this was 12 years ago before we knew about wipe and load. And so let your brain figure out how to move this before you go back to 90 mile an hour pitches. Yeah. So that's the next two days. And athletes are so kinesthetic. They'll figure it out. Yeah. So I would vote for five weeks. But here's the thing. I know what I did is going to be earth shattering, amazing between now and then. But exactly. it's also, like I said, there has to be a plan, right? Some athletes are terrified of changing things too soon. They don't want to change their shoelaces too soon. So I'm not giving them the, I'm not giving them more anxiety than they need to take on. This is safe. The changes we are making are safe. The voice inside me is they're going to run like an animal tomorrow because this is all freed up and this is going to be whatever. So part of my glitch was, not giving them too much that they can't handle it, where they think so much is undone, where it's not safe. Because we get that sometimes. I think a lot of patients are listening for me anyways, are listening to the podcast. They're hearing us talk about undoing scar tissue, contra, not contraindications, but when things can go sideways, when we undo scar tissue and things can get worse. I get people that come in with that very real fear that it could potentially hurt more or get worse. And I was like, it's not very safe. You're in extremely good hands. We're not going to undo anything that you or I can't handle together. Oh, okay. So and we have a secret weapon. I swear to God, 40 and 89, yes. 40 and 92, quiet the midbrain. It's going to be fine. Really? Yes. Quiet the sensory cortex, forget everything you knew about how the left leg ever worked. Yes. And then increase secretions in the cerebellum. I want you to remember how the left leg is working now and coordinate the left leg and everything else. Yes. And you do that while the patient's moving. It's amazing. Yes. And it, and it goes quick. Let's get to some questions and comments. Hey, before we get, because uh, the question is awesome, but did you have a starting, a place where you wanted to start 40 minutes ago? The plan was have a plan. Oh, <laughs> okay. And, and I'll get to a little more of that after this. I'll, I'll tie it together. But yeah. um, there's Summer. I'm going to an event for fire victims this weekend. So she's going to Maui. Just concussion in Vegas, calm adrenals, relax and balance, a concussion in Vegas for sure. It, the other thing with concussion in Vegas for those listening is you can modify it. I never talk about other devices, but if you have a MEND device, do not use the Vegas protocol on that. It quiets the Vegas and that's exactly the opposite of what you need to do. So aside from that, if you're running concussion in Vegas, especially for fire victims, increase the amount of time on 40 and 94, quiet the medulla, increase the time. It runs for four minutes now on 40 and 89 because one of our most primitive fears, and especially those on Maui is a fire and the trauma. So 40 and 89 for, I would say, eight minutes to 12 minutes would be completely reasonable. Turn on the Vegas as long as they don't have burns. So if they have active burns, you can turn on the Vegas for maybe two to four minutes. If they're just traumatized, but not physically burned, you can do increased secretions in the vagus forever. Smoke inhalation. <clears throat> Some of the thing with smoke inhalation is it starts in the pharynx. So it's we think about it as being the lungs, but the heavier particles of the smoke drop out 
in the sinuses, the pharynx, the bronchi, and then the lighter particles get into the lungs. Metals, chemicals, uh, 57, 900, 920. We don't know what metals are involved in the houses. I would stick with 57, 900, 920. So reduce the number of channel A's because now I've just given you five times the channel B's. 25, 75 for the sinuses, 43 for the pharynx, 64 for the bronchi, 17 for the lungs, right? And then I would use two machines at a time, one to deal with the emotional stuff, one to deal just program one unit for the sinuses, the pharynx, the bronchi, the lungs with probably traumas fair 294 and then 40, probably allergy reaction. So 294 trauma, 40, nine is allergy reaction, 40 is inflammation. And then the three toxicity frequencies. That way, with those five channel Bs and 294, 49, 57, 900, and six channel A's, at two minutes apiece, somebody has to do the math. But I think you're close to an hour just on the lungs. So, one custom care with just a protocol for smoke inhalation that deals with all of that. And yeah, and then the other thing you need to remember to do summer is to treat yourself every day. So you have a custom care on a converter. You work in the shelters, you work with the trauma victims, and you go home at night and you treat yourself for especially concussion in Vegas. And if you're working in, because Maui still smells Every place I've ever been where there's been a fire, there's still particles in the air weeks later. So I I do that. Did I miss anything, do you think? No, that's very comprehensive. Okay. Leif Erickson, you get to know who is inside. Oh, you can tell Leif is a Van Gelder. <laughs> oh, VPPV. Linda Avery asks, what frequencies do you re recommend to use for lightheadedness and BPPV? That's benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Learn to do the Epley maneuver because BPPV, as far as I know, the solution for that is the Epley maneuver. And concussion protocol, you just have to take out 94 and 94. And the four that you mentioned, 40, quiet, the medulla, the make you spinny and barf center in the brain is located in the medulla. And 94 and 94 for vestibular patients is risky. So I'd stick with 40 and 94 and 40 and 44. And then there is a reason that God invented drugs. Meclizine in the US and most of Europe, except for Germany, and I think even Australia, meclizine is prescription. What's up with that? Anyway, yeah, there's, there, that's, meclizine is helpful. It quiets the brain part of the vertigo. Oh, okay. Bullock, that is a great question. I need help with the language to get people to come in two times a week. It's so much fun to follow the path of amazing improvements when they do. I don't take insurance. So I also need to figure out how to package it so they are motivated to come frequently enough to fix the problem. The challenge is, I, in my experience, the people that have been treating them don't expect to fix the problem. They expect to have the patient come in once a month or twice a month 
forever. It's okay. So you, the way I language it, Carrie, is, and it's much easier to have this conversation after the end of the first session, when you can measure the range of motion before you treat them, let's pretend it's your neck, and you measure the range of motion after you treat them. And it's okay. Your range of motion increased by 30% in one hour. Now, if we wait a week or two weeks until it's back your start, we're going to be doing the same thing over and over again just to stay in the same place. Yep. And my goal is to get this fixed. I'll give you exercises. You do the exercises. I'll do the maintenance. Give me twice a week for four to six weeks and let's fix this thing. And we will probably be done in four weeks. If you're not improving, we'll figure out why or we're done. If we get to a place where you're the same two, three weeks in a row, then we're done. And then it's like taking your car in for lube oil and filter. I'll see you every three months and you'll be out of pain in between. That's my goal. When I was in sales, <laughs> which I didn't realize was going to be such a, a help, you sell benefits. You don't sell features. And I never thought of it before that. Yeah. So the feature is I'm going to treat you and you're going to be more comfortable at the end of this visit. The benefit is letting the patient know that your goal is to get them independent so they don't need to see you, to get them fixed, pain-free and comfortable in the way that is the most important to them in the shortest possible time. Mm -hmm. And I think the best time to have that conversation is the end of a successful visit. I agree. What do you think? I totally agree. Again, I don't take insurance. I'm a total cash practice. I sell the same sort of benefits. Like when you discuss a plan, a lot of times I do a discovery call before somebody comes to see me. I see, just like you see some out-of-state patients. So they want to have the chat before they come in sometimes. So how long do I have to stay? Can you fix me in one treatment? The answer is never yes. But I always say, I go, we should get a very good read after the first treatment, how you're going to respond and if we're going to be a good fit to work together. But like you said, you have to break down the goal. The goal is to get out of pain. The goal is to move better. And if I see you more frequently, this process is going to happen faster and in less treatments than if we span it out. Because like you said, then there's time to backslide. Like we want to always build off of the benefits from the last treatment. So if you give me eight treatments and we can go back to back as opposed to 20 treatments over the course of two years, like what would you rather prefer? And you're right. You want to have that conversation once there's been some improvement. So they have that to, to go on. And it, for me, it's also a matter of economics. My goal is to get you to your goal so that you spend the least amount of money possible. Yeah. You have spent a fortune over the last six years seeing these people, practitioners, once every two weeks. Right. For on and off for six years and it never holds you always end up back where you started part of the reason you end up back where you started is that they're treating the wrong thing yes that one case that we did in Kona where people wanted to know how I use the pinwheel oh yep remember that one yep. l4 l5 what's that about and then s2 all the other dermatomes 
were normal. And then the history matched the dermatomes. Oh yeah, I forgot. Oh, I know. And she had T1 and T2 in her arm, but not her trunk. And I said, what did you do that did that? And what happened to your neck? And she said, oh, I forgot. I fell off my bike and hit my chin and I held on to the handlebars. So one of the practitioners said, oh, she has a nerve traction injury in T1 and T2, but not a T1 and T2 disc. So the nerves here are fine. Right. And then S2 on one of the sides of her head, she doesn't have nerve pain and she doesn't have headaches. Mm. But the sensory exam wasn't normal. She said, well, yeah, it's sensitive when I comb my hair back there. It's amazing. I, so you have to treat the right thing with the right thing. And I think the place where one of the reasons I love our practitioners is that they are people who like to think. Yeah. If it doesn't suit you, if what you want to do is hook somebody up on sticky pads, oh my God, I got an email for a microcurrent conference that said, hey, there's evidence that a, the machine that picks the frequencies for you is better than the one where you pick the frequencies. That's a good face. And I just know I trust what's in between your ears. I don't think any machine would have picked scarring in the appendix to move, make my hip and SI move better. Nope. I can confidently say that. And on the med, which is a device that's it's a pulse DMF, and it has a feature where it does the diagnosis and then it chooses the frequencies to run on the patient. We were at an A4M meeting. We had a booth down the way from the on-demand group. And one of their reps, technicians, came down to our booth. And she'd been using the on-demand forever. And all I did, ask her if she had an auto accident ever. Yes. Where's your pain? All over. Do your hands and feet hurt? Yeah. I did her knee reflexes, hyperactive patellar reflexes bilaterally. And it's so I put her on the table. She's 40 and 10. I didn't have to touch her. And she'd been treating herself for months. You have to treat the right thing with the right thing. Yes. I. Yes. I love our practitioners because they love to think. Yes, exactly. Yes. Somebody just written, if I didn't know someone had a vestibular issue and 94 caused an ongoing head headache, how do you undo the problem? 40 and 94. Yeah. And meclizine. And meclizine. Yeah, and meclizine. There's a reason God invented drugs. This is meclizine is bonine. You can go into the store and buy a little package of bonine, B-O-N-I-N-E. It's a trade name. And it's got eight pills and it's ridiculously expensive. If you do a vestibular screen on somebody, then you just get meclizine from Amazon and it comes, I have a bottle of a thousand and it also comes in three bottles of like a hundred or 50 or something like that, little bottles. And I just used to keep one bottle in in all three treatment rooms in the drawer. That's just, yeah. This 40 and 94 and 40 and 44. Part of the reason for the headache is, now that I think about it, it's not just 40 and 94, but it's that when whatever it is that 94 and 94, concussion in the medulla, whatever that does to people with vestibular injuries, their neck muscles go berserk and get really tight. And that's what creates the headache. Mm. It's the tight muscles that jam the facets. So you get headache pain from the neck muscles. You get referred pain from the upper facet joints getting clenched. And so... 40 and 94, just quieting the inner ear 
will relax the neck muscles that and then 40 and 94. So tell the spinny part of your brain to just calm down. It's going to be fine. That's that would be my guess. And then yeah. my cuisine. That's the plan in place. It's to tie back the plan. And we we talk a lot about how to phrase certain things to patients is just as important when they're in treatment as what your hands are doing or what their range of motion is doing. And I think for a lot of demographics, having the big plan is very important. The chronic pain patients, athletes, law enforcement really need to know the plan. They feel safe when there is a plan in place. Athletes need to know all the plays, all the potential for danger, all the potential for success, this is where they thrive. So I try to lay out the plan for today and lay out the plan for the time going from treatment right now to the next time I'm gonna see you. They feel safe with that structure. Law enforcement, first responders, fire, they need to know all the little dark spots to shine the flashlight on so that they feel safe so potential things that could go awry, what they could feel for the good, for the bad, if things stay the same, what do I do? So I, I think that's an, another important part of what my message for today was, is to lay out the plan for the treatment in real time, talk to them, walk your way through it. I felt so much safety when you were explaining and yeah, you were teaching while you were treating me, but I think if there was nobody else in the room that would have been the exact same dynamic. Exactly. I always tell the patient what I'm doing and why. Yes. And, and then the patient and I both can feel how it's going. Yeah. The other thing about, it's amazing you should mention police officers, first responders, fighter pilots. I've worked on black, black ops and military types. And oddly enough, it's always facets. Yeah. Police officers and physical exam, history and physical, pinwheel, lean forward, lean back. First responders, um, 40 and 89 is essential. We were treating one guy in Cleveland the reason we were treating him was scarring in the esophagus because of radiation for a, a tumor in his head and neck radiation. As I'm working on him, you know how they get a little dwarfed? He starts telling me about his life as a first responder of firemen and starts sobbing when he tells me about finding the patient here and the patient's head there and it's okay so we actually I only had one machine at the time so I would switch to just 40 and 89 until he stopped crying and then I'd go back and work on his neck and then he'd get drifty again and start crying again you go back to 40 and 89 back then i didn't know that you have one custom care in the office where there's a single frequency combination that's just 40 and 89 and you put it on the guy while you're treating his neck for both. No, I. you're right. I didn't do it without even thinking about it. God bless you for putting words to it, right? To have a plan. I didn't have a plan up when I put my hands on you except to know that it wasn't your left SI joint. It was just an observation this week, especially to shine the light on the scary bits. Explain what you're finding yeah. and how they match. Yes. Your history says this, the physical exam said that, your symptoms are this, they all match. Yes. Sometimes you say they all match except that. Yeah. I want to know what that is. We might do that today or we might end up figuring it out tomorrow. Yep. It's... Pretty fun. There's a plan. Yes. I love the plan.
Okay, we're out of time, but I have a quote. Someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. Amen. I like that. There is a there was a plan in place and now someone's reaping the benefits. So you've planted many seeds. <laughs> There's many trees growing because of you. And there's the thank you card from the lady. Look at that. Right? It's like the she gave me a necklace, but the, the consultation prior to my colon surgery, and I encouraged her to write her own protocol, and it helped her healing. Someone is sitting in the shade because someone planted a tree. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. cool. That's energy at its finest. Oh, I am not here next week. I am unexpectedly going to be on an airplane. Are you going someplace fun or someplace for work or both? Work is always fun. Okay. <laughs> All of the above. All of the above. See, yes. But let me double check to make sure because if I'm there, I could chat. I will double check. If and not, you, we'll be here. Do you know what we're doing next week? What? Once a year, I take the staff to Edgefield, which oh. is, you've been to Edgefield, right? They have a hot tub that is, I don't know, eighth of a mile long. It's a, a lazy river surrounded by trees and whatever. We close the office for the morning, let everything go to voicemail. And these three people work are so hard that it there's no words i'm not kidding when i say i just show up and kevin does all the work so we go to edgefield hang out in the hot tub have adult beverages or iced tea or whatever and just sit and visit and be people and remember what it's like the affection that we have for each other is part of the reason fsm works Yes. It's not a job. It's a family. Yeah. We'll come back here at two o'clock in time for me to fix my hair and put makeup on. And debrief all about your day. And yeah, we'll we'll talk, we'll figure out what to talk about. Yes, there's always questions and people that have ears to listen to all the things that you have to say. They keep coming, so that's good. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a yes, delight. It's always a good one. It is. See you later, everybody. See you soon. Yeah. Have a great rest of your week. You too. Bye. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.